The advantage is that you're independent, you can be nimble, quick, turn on a dime, invest in interesting things, get in, get out. And the disadvantage, particularly as we saw in 2008 and 2009, is that we're independent. Um, you got it. <laughs> the work that I described earlier uh, involving interactions between physicists and economists uh, is still very active today in, in the work of a number of our faculty members. This is an editorial in Nature, written, the journal Nature, written by economist Duncan Foley and physicist Dawn Farmer, um, middle of last year, arguing that a particular form of modeling, termed agent-based modeling, is an important strategy for trying to understand very large, complex systems made up of many interacting components and many connections among them, uh, like our economy or our society as a whole. Other examples of current ongoing economic uh, work, this, was, uh, this talk was prepared um, quite independently of Ken Arrow, but there are a number of connections to Ken Arrow in it. Um, in addition to already featuring Ken himself. Um, the bad caricature in the upper right-hand corner is of one of uh, Ken's students, John Genicopoulos, who is now uh, a, a member of our external faculty and an eminent economist uh, at Yale. Um, John, has, John has been making the pitch for quite some time, long ignored, uh, now very much uh, very much more mainstream, that leverage or collateral is just as important uh, an economic quantity as is interest, which is the, the primary focus of the, of the Federal Reserve System. And uh, you can probably bet that regulation of collateral or leverage is going to be an important component of any, of any new uh, financial regulations going forward. This describes, uh, this is a recent article from The Economist describing uh, a, another meeting sponsored by the National Fo Science Foundation uh, focused on uh, alternative modeling appro approaches to, alternative modeling approaches to trying to understand uh, the economy and, and, its, uh, and its mechanisms. I want to uh, give you just one other uh, example of ongoing work. Uh, tomorrow we are uh, holding a corporate and business network meeting uh, in conjunction with Google. One of the topics at that meeting is going to be the general problem of malware and Santa Fe Institute has a particular uh, particular position or a particular point of view on, on this idea uh, called computing in the wild and it's simply this that as long as this thing is on your desktop, disconnected with the rest of the world, it's a pretty conventional engineering problem. Yes, the, the combination of energy and information is an interesting problem in itself, but conventional engineering strategies are a very, uh, a very interesting and, and appropriate way to think about its design. But as soon as you connect it to the world, <coughs> arguably, you're now computing in the wild, and all bets about what that system is going to encounter in terms of the kinds of threats, uh, both uh, low level and high level, uh, are off, and computing becomes much more a, an ecological and a biological uh, problem than it is just an, in, just an informational computer science and computer engineering problem. I want to conclude by saying just one word about our corporate and business network. It's made up of 40 companies, large and small. You'll see a mixture of, of old-style manufacturing organizations with new views on the world, like John Deere, uh, high-tech uh, information uh, technology industries, both hardware and software, Cisco, Intel, Microsoft, Google, a number of financial services companies. And this uh, organization is a vital part of SFI's connection to the world, and it's a very unusual way for real world concerns to engage basic science. That's a feature of, of our corporate and business network that is virtually unlike uh, that of any other. And if any of you have any further interests uh, in the network, 
um, I would be glad to talk with you after this evening's, uh, this evening's meeting. So with that brief, uh, not brief enough, uh, introduction to, to the Santa Fe Institute, let me now introduce or reintroduce Ken Arrow, who's going to say uh, a few words uh, to us on uh, a topic of his choice. I'm not going to constrain you, Ken. Here, of course, the the model which was associated with economics, not entirely correctly, the point of view of the thing which Richard Palmer referred to as our arrogance, was a vision of an integrating system, a system in which people came with very different interests, very different uh, points of view, very different knowledge, very different knowing how to produce different goods, having different capacities, having different tastes. Um, and somehow goods got transferred from one individual to another by buying and selling in a smooth way. Everything was happening, so to speak, behind the backs uh, of the uh, participants. And, and, so, and somehow the seeming chaos, people were grabbing different things, could nevertheless be reconciled. And essentially the idea was the market as the way. People wanting to buy, willing to pay, but there were people there willing to supply. And uh, the price goes up, more people are willing to supply, and less people want to choke on price will finally achieve a balance. And not only achieve a balance in any one market, but will achieve a balance across markets. Some products will be more profitable, and so capitalists will uh, switch their energies and their investment possibilities to the higher profitability. So the rates of profit tend to be equalized. This is the vision of the world. The idea of, of things happening smoothly with little knowledge by the individual participants, and yet an order, a, a kind of order, is imposed on the world—a a, um, a, a spontaneous order, to use a phrase that was uh, has been sometimes used in this context. This is the vision which is in, goes back to the 18th century with Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. It talks about the invisible hand. Things happen that are not people are not aware of. This is. You know, the idea that trade involves bringing people together who don't even know each other, and that things transfer to, from low value to high values, is really, uh, is really illustrated by a remark from Herodotus. In the fifth century, Herodotus probably traveled enormously, was probably far better informed than almost any other man about different cultures, about different spaces. But he noted, for example, that the Athenians made things of bronze. And to make bronze, you need copper and tin. Well, copper is fairly abundant, occurs in a number of places, say, from modern Turkey was a big source. That was easy to understand, but where did tin come from? Well, all he knew was that tin came from the Greek settlers in what's now Marseille. They didn't produce tin. They bought it from Gauls, Gallic merchants, who floated down, they rafted the tin down on the Rhone River. Where, where they got it, they didn't know at all. It was a vague rumor that beyond Gaul there was a big island called Britain or Brit Britain. You know. But it was just a rumor. It wasn't really until about the third century, about 200 years later, that people really identified there really was such a place. And we now know that's where the tin came from, because there, if it, these tins all have impurities in them, and you can identify the source quite precise. We know they came from Cornwall. But the Corns, Cornish people probably knew nothing, but never heard of Greece. The Greeks didn't know about Cornwall, nevertheless. Okay, so this is the idea of a, of a smoothly adjusting economy where individuals need know very little about each other. Well, it's a great vision, and the, the trouble with it, so we, one of the reasons why it's so lively, is it really does have a good deal of truth to it. Unfortunately, it's not, there are things that it doesn't take care of. Okay, now the, uh, the, the and we, one of the things we've had is, didn't say in the ninth since the time capitalism, private enterprise, private property, and so on, became dominant, say after 1800, um, is that we, the economy has been subject to recurrent fits of prosperity and depression. And not only that, even more mysterious, that, and that's already kind of mysterious. I mean, in the old days, things were bad because it was a, you know, rains didn't fall. You know, you can understand why people were starving. There, there wasn't a, 
they, there was some fam there was a famine for one reason or another, you know, floods, yeah. uh, rainfalls, or whatever. Uh, here, no. The uh, in the middle of what seems to be nothing, suddenly business conditions slacken. This a race that was noted right after the Napoleonic Wars, say around 1820. And another thing that was noted is that one thing that emerged from from the 18th century on it was borrowing and lending. You had money, you didn't, we wanted it, well, it was safe to keep it here under your bed for so what, you know, when it was robbed. You put it, you gave it to the goldsmith when the, it was development of banks. And you just drew out the money when you wanted it. Well, then, but you know, the bank had the money, they lent it out. Uh, so credit, I remember people were issuing bonds, securities already existed. So, well, the governments were issuing bonded debt, that's the origin of it, but then other kinds of private enterprises of some kinds would produce bonds, sell, you know, to, uh, uh, so people could buy them and get returns. And every now and then, there'd be a freeze. Somehow, the money wasn't available. The banks wouldn't lend, they failed, they, the depositors couldn't get their money back. This is not quite the same thing as depressions. Usually a financial crisis, which I described, produces a depression. But dep there are many depressions or recessions to be able Somehow we have, we're avoiding the word depression. <laughs> Well, not, I guess, I don't know why, but it's always called a recession now. But anyway, um, we used to, when, I, when I was a graduate student, we call them depressions, but whatever. Uh, the, um, let's, let's use the modern term. Anyway, you have these recurrent recessions, but you also have financial crises. And I said financial crisis usually induced a recession, but there were recessions without financial crisis. And this doesn't fit into this self-adjusting mechanism. Of course, it's clear why the economy doesn't remain, just keep on repeating itself. Uh, one thing, population grows, new peoples arrive, new countries come into foreign trade, and above all, the driver of change is technological innovation. So the prices will not continue to be the same because there's always new things around, and therefore you can't. The people discovered that you can use oil, burn oil, for example, take a big discovery of the 19th century, change things completely. Instead of taking oil from Wales, which at best was good for illumination, you could get, you could get heat Instead of coal, well, you had coal, of course, that was known, that's been known for many, long time. This discovery that you could have oil instead. And oil has got a lot of advantages and disadvantages, and especially when it comes to things that move, it's a lot easier to carry coal, it's a lot easier to carry oil than coal. There were coal driven, as you know, there were coal driven uh, cars in the early days, but they didn't survive the competition well. Um, so you get, get you get oil out of the ground. And I, you know, so these all these things change. So what what was the prices of things will uh, will keep on adjusting because there are new things um, to, to spend money on. So it's continuously shaking up of this process. But the usual picture is yes, it will always be the shaking up. But each after each shock, things will come together. But of course, we had I say against this was the recurrent fact that we are getting these business cycles. We used to call. Um, ups and downs, and especially the financial crises. And of course, it was capped by the, the greatest of all of these, that, that is the Great Depression of uh, the year 1929. Uh, and really lasted in many ways, um, although we went up and down, we had, by the usual definition, we had several recessions. The fact is the economy performed, the United States particularly, performed poorly Well, um, it, from 1929 to 1940. Now that's, that's an unusual event. We haven't had anything like that since. But it was a financial crisis. Banks were failing all over the place. 10,000 banks failed. That happens. I'm old enough to remember this. <laughs> and the banks literally were closed for 10 days at one point. All banks. Um, to, stop, to stop the, to sort of, to slow down. That was interesting. Why? That shouldn't make any real difference from a point of view of a self-equilibrating mechanism. It just stops the downward process. The idea is somehow this process was feeding, without any good ideas, was feeding on itself. And somehow if you just stopped it, it would help. And it did, remarkably. 